I'm Amber Hunt, and this is Accused, the unsolved murder of Elizabeth Andes. The thing about it was the police got on the boyfriend, and once the, it, he got off, they, they stopped the investigation, even though they said he couldn't have done it. The timeline wasn't right. I'm like, this is an open case, is it not? It's, you know, you don't have a convicted killer. You're still supposed to be looking at it. Is anybody looking at it? No one seems to be looking at it. Well, you know, their hands are tied and on and on. And it really just seemed ridiculous to me. My husband and I have this ongoing joke. Bear with me because it's definitely gallows humor. Because we watch true crime shows like Forensic Files, and because I've worked for years as a crime reporter, we know that if something sinister happened to either one of us, the other would come under immediate police scrutiny. So we joke, be nice, or I'll hide a note in my sock drawer telling police to look at you if anything ever happens to me. The jury would eat it up. It's macabre, I know. We laugh because that sort of thing is funny to us, but the truth is... If something were to happen to one of us, police would be analyzing everything the other person did. Every web search, every email, every quip made to family members about some benign frustration in our marriage. I mean, take a look at your last month's worth of text messages with your partner. Imagine how many of them would seem ominous to someone attaching dark motives to each exchange. No matter how loving and supportive your partnership might be, it no doubt could look a little pockmarked under intense magnification. Bob Young says he knows all about that. He describes his relationship with Beth Andes as solid and loving, but that's not what investigators saw. Last episode, I described Beth's murder and how prosecutors zeroed in on Bob, who had found her lifeless body in the Oxford apartment they shared just off Miami University's campus. The police theory was that Beth and Bob had fought because their recent college graduation meant that they'd have to split up. Beth didn't want to, prosecutors alleged, and Bob didn't take kindly to her nagging him to stay. He throttled her in a fit of rage and then tied her up and stabbed her to make it look like the death was a sex crime. We'd love to tell you why police were set on this theory way back when, why it rang true to them. But our queries into this case haven't exactly been welcomed by investigators from the time. Hi, I'm trying to reach Patrick Baird. Who is this, please? Uh, My name's Amber Hunt. I'm a reporter with the Cincinnati Inquirer. Okay. This is Patrick. What do you want to see me about? Oh, okay. Hi. I'm I'm a reporter. I've been working on a story taking a look at the 1978 Beth Andes case. And uh, don't, uh, I'm not going there. I've been retired since '96. So you won't, you don't want to talk to me about it. I do not. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm taking a look at it from the beginning. It would be really helpful to talk to you. Those, those records have all been sealed, and I'm not going to end up in some kind of court. For oh, I, I understand. Court. We actually, they're unsealed at this point because we got permission from. The you person have, who sealed them. You have my statement. I am not interested in doing this. Okay. okay. That's Patrick Baird. He was the lead investigator on the case. I tried for months to track him down, especially because some of his former colleagues were certain he'd be interested in talking shop about an old case. I was really excited to finally find him, and... Well, I guess if he's game to talk, he made it pretty clear it wouldn't be with me. So I figured I'd start from scratch and learn about Bob and Beth as a couple, how their friends saw them, how Bob remembers them, even how Beth's family recalls them together, in hopes of shedding light on whether that official version of events makes any sense. To do that, I'll start at the beginning. Beth was the second oldest of four children born to Shirley and Charles Andes. Her older sister was named Leslie, and she had one younger brother and one younger sister. Their names are Chuck and Carrie. They spent most of their childhoods near Canton, Ohio, where Beth followed the path cut by her big sister, graduating from Glenwood High School in 1974. Chuck remembers Beth as happy and stylish. She was closer with her big sisters, as young girls tend to be, but she still made time for a little brother, too. 
My producer Amanda and I drove to Canton, which is about an hour south of Cleveland, to flip through old yearbooks. Beth appeared several times. Back then, she had long brown hair, much longer than she'd wear it in college. And she was clearly active, serving on student council her junior and senior years. She was photographed in a cute, fitted, long sleeve, but above the knee, knit dress as a junior attendant at a homecoming event. Her dad's in that picture, too, leading Beth across an auditorium with her arms interlocked. This is the father who spent years after she died trying to figure out what happened to his little girl. The photo with that in mind is heartbreaking. Beth worked at a family-owned spot called Milk and Honey, serving ice cream sundaes and classic diner food. It was quaint, 50 style, like a little soda shop with these colorful stools sidled up to a serving counter and vintage Pepsi Cola tin advertisements hanging on the walls. Canton native R.J. Valella remembers that he, Beth, and a mutual friend were all weighing out colleges at the same time together. We had been accepted to Miami University, and we visited the campus uh, together during that uh, during the summer before we all said yes, and then we all, you know, I marooned with Grant my freshman year, and she was in the dorm right across the uh, quad. Oh wow! So, uh, okay. We we all kept very much in in touch with, you know, we were all close friends. We you know went out drinking together, went to you know parties together, did fun things like, uh, oh, you know, college-type things together. Like Beth, Bob Young had been Ohio-born and raised. He grew up in Fairborn, about three hours southwest of Canton. He was the middle child of three, with an older brother named Bill and his sister Pam, who's two years younger than Bob. The young parents were school teachers. Mom taught English to fourth and seventh graders, and Dad was a phys ed teacher who was head basketball coach, assistant football coach, even coached baseball for a stint. By the time Bob started kindergarten, he was immersed in sports. When Bob was weighing colleges, Miami University topped his list because of its academic and football programs. He hadn't been recruited to play, so he psyched himself up and walked out onto the field during tryouts. When he walked off, he was wearing number 25. Bob remembers his relationship with free-spirited Beth as having started off slowly. Well, I remember uh, going by uh, their uh, dorm. You know, we would go down. This was my sophomore year. And so we'd go down to, we'd practice, and then we'd go to this training hall and have dinner, and then we'd... uh, sometimes have a couple of meetings. So on the coming back, a lot of times I'd stop off at her dorm and just go visit and say hi. And, and I, I did that pretty regularly for a while. I can't even remember how long, but that's sort of how we, we met. And, and just uh, her and Hallie shared a, a, a dorm room together. So I did that. Uh, I did that you know, pretty frequently, I guess. And we became friends just doing that. Just you know, I, I lived at a different place, and I was walking back to my place, but I'd stop off there pretty regularly. Her, her, just she was fun to be around. She her attitude, her she was fun. She was, uh, you know, I, I, and she was just fun to be around, hang out with. So that's mainly why I was, I was doing it. What drew him to Beth was more than her down-to-earth good looks. He said, "She was vivacious and headstrong." I, I wouldn't say. Uh, bubbly, but I would say positive and and friendly, and you know, liked life and you know enjoyed life. Uh, but just mainly always was friendly and nice, you know, you know, a nice person. Friends don't remember them fighting, and neither does Bob. But he does remember that they had taken a break a couple of years into their relationship. That was just before he headed out west for a geology trip that lasted a few weeks one summer. Letters he wrote during that trip ended up being combed by investigators for clues. The only damning note made by detectives in the case file was that in one of the letters, Bob described having dropped acid. This note was mentioned in a police memo, though it apparently was considered benign enough that they didn't raise it during trial. 
I asked Bob if that trip west was the chance for he and Beth to rethink their relationship. It was a little bit of one, uh, and, and I don't even know if you'd call it a break, but this was before I went on that trip. There was a little bit, but really, I guess when I realized when I was out on that trip that I didn't want it, you know, I wanted us to be together, and so I did buy her a little ring out there and brought it back and gave it to her. Uh, it wasn't anything fancy, but uh, that probably helped me realize that that I did want her, you know, in in my life. So. Do you remember what the ring looked like? It's a little gold ring with a uh, green. Uh, it's a stone from one of the stones that were popular. I think it was. Uh, I should know since I'm a geologist, but uh, <laughs> I don't remember what it was. It was a green stone that was uh, jade. It was like a jade stone, but it was something that was popular in, in Wyoming that you could find out there pretty easily. Okay. So. Meanwhile, Beth was almost anti-establishment. Her friend, Hallie McCauley, back then known as Hallie Chapman, said they prided themselves on being the bra-burning anti-sorority type. And yet... Once Beth started dating Bob, she started dragging her friends to all the football games. Beth lived with Hallie almost her entire college career. They'd met the first week of college in the school's dining hall. They had different roommates at first, but they became such fast friends that they petitioned the university to ditch the assigned roomies and live together instead. Here's Hallie talking about that time period. Is that the standard process when you... You find somebody you want to swap roomies, mm -hmm. you petition? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we had to get the okay from each of our roommates, and uh, she and I sort of navigated that without hurting any feelings or allowing our current roommates to feel as if they were, they were unwanted. And um, so it took a couple of months of uh, planning, and by end of the first quarter, we were roommates. So what was it? You said you have overlapping interests, um, but there, I'm assuming personality-wise, there must have been something that mm -hmm. grabbed you. Mm -hmm. So the things that I remember being the instant connections between the two of us was music. And so the bands in the 70s, Jackson Brown, Van Morrison, the Eagles, um, we knew all the words to certain songs. There was a particular Jackson Brown song that the Eagles um, had also recorded, Take It Easy. And I remember the first couple of times we hung out together, we both knew all the words to that song. Um, and music really became, for all of us, a theme over those four years of in fact, um, I was home for a semester, a trimester, and many of the letters that Beth wrote to me when I was home during that break were on concerts she had seen and albums she had bought and things that uh, she had listened to. At one point, um, her boyfriend Bob had brought her or lent her her hysteria, so that was written about in a letter, so much better than TV and an album she had bought, Fleetwood Mac. So it was very much something that we had in common and enjoyed really together and, and with all of our friends. Mm -hmm. Later, Beth's letters became much more Bob-centered. By spring semester, Hallie realized that Beth and Bob were a full-fledged couple. So I, I think it was really sophomore year that their relationship mm -hmm blossomed even though we had met Bob freshman year. Hallie remembers Bob as being soft-spoken and gentle. He was a football player, sure, but by no means a quote-unquote typical jock. He didn't seem interested in sorority girls or cheerleaders. He fit right in Beth's bra-burning modern friends. Hallie was dating Rich, a man she would later marry. He was the only one of the sizable group of friends who didn't attend Miami. Rich went to Bowling Green in northern Ohio. He started dating Hallie in the summer between their freshman and sophomore years, and he would drive down to hang out with the crew. Do you remember oh, meeting Beth? I do. Um, distinctly, it was sophomore mm -hmm. year. You guys that were living together in the dorm, and Hallie and I had started dating that summer mm -hmm. between freshman and sophomore year mm -hmm. after being friends for a long time. 
and you know going to visit her in in Miami at Miami, which is about a three hour drive, and going down there and they were roommates and met Beth for the first time there and obviously saw her every time I was down there, assuming she was there. In fact, I think you visited once when I wasn't there when I was yeah, home. Yeah, I mean, for that. I became so very, you know, good friends with Hallie's friends, Beth and Bob, and the others that we had, uh, Malia, mm -hmm. Melissa, yeah, and we had a nice group, group mm -hmm. uh, of, of friends. Mm -hmm. So when Hal had taken a semester off, I went down and saw the Miami crew. Mm -hmm. Distinctly remember every time. Beth and I saw each other when I was coming down, right, and I was getting there for, for, you know, after the trip down, she often was the first to, you know, open the door, mm -hmm. and that big smile and a big hug, so mm -hmm. those are distinct uh, memories that I have. Mm -hmm. Both Hallie and Rich remember Beth as being supremely confident. Hallie says it was as if Beth were ahead of her time almost. She wasn't interested in being a stay-at-home mom like her own mom had been. The degree she was getting wasn't for show. She planned to launch a career after college. She was an attractive girl with a fiery spirit who caught guys' attention, and she was self-possessed enough to have no problem saying, hey, back off, I'm dating someone. Beth was friendly but not flirtatious, and everyone knew where she stood with Bob. She was very happy with Bob. Loved him very much. I mean, a lot of guys liked Beth. Beth's very attractive and pretty together, very independent. And, you know, I think, you know, a lot of guys had crushes on her. But, you know, she was, she was always pretty straight and narrow with the, staying with, with Bob. And uh, I think they had a pretty solid relationship. R.J. Valella agreed. Guys knew where Beth stood. Did you have a crush on her? Well, I always uh, liked her, kind of had a little crush on her, but I knew she was dating Bob, <laughs> so I knew there was uh, no, no, nothing for me to pursue there. So I admit I was kind of relieved when R.J. acknowledged he had a crush, because really, it's hard to imagine one of Beth's straight male college friends not having a crush on her. I would have been a little suspicious if he'd said no, or at least no without an explanation. Like, maybe she was more like a sister to me or something. Of course R.J. had a crush. And maybe it was even a bit more than that. As a matter of fact, I, to this day, I, I think if, if she had lived and we had, um, uh, and we had stayed in contact uh, and, I had, and we were both free, that I think we, we might have gone out and something might have transpired. But that's one of those things that you never know. You, you look back and say, oh, well, that was a big opportunity that kind of slid by. Because I'm still single. I've never got married. So, oh, really? Yeah. So um, she was always one I looked at back on. And, and in my mind, I said, yeah, she had all the qualities I would have liked to, in a woman to, enough to, uh, to marry. And I really haven't, uh, you know, you only run across maybe, oh, I'm going to say half a dozen of those people in your life, I think. Yeah. Right? RJ is the only friend of Beth's I could find who had believed the police theory that Bob had killed her. He says he last saw Beth alive over Christmas break, right after she'd graduated. She'd gone home to the Cleveland area and swung by Canton for a party on the 25th. We were home for Christmas, uh, uh, two or three, uh, just several days before she was murdered. Right. And we had gone out to, to visit friends and have a few drinks together. And she had confided in me at that point in time that she wanted to break up with Bob. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. And uh, she said she needed to, that Bob wasn't giving her what she needed and she needed to move on with her, her life. And she was looking forward to starting a new life in, in retail and with a, maybe with a, a new boyfriend not that she was dating anybody at that anybody else at that point in time but it, she had come to the conclusion and it wasn't an easy conclusion for her for her she i know she struggled over it for um for a couple two or three months was she upset when she told you or was it more matter of fact or it was um i knew something was bothering her and i, I kind of kept probing and asking you know hey what's going on you don't seem your usually bubbly self 
And finally she goes, I, I think I'm going to break up with Bob. And um, and then uh, we, we, you know, we went our separate ways. And then two day, two or three days later, I'm uh, I'm sitting at home, and I, I hear there was a murder in Oxford. That caught my attention. And then I heard it was uh, Beth Andy's, and that was really freaked me out. In this world before Facebook and Twitter, all of Beth's friends have gut-wrenching stories about how they learned the awful truth. Hallie had been tricked at work to go to a meeting to give her mother and sister time to show up at her office and break the news in person. Her boss had even hidden the day's newspaper, worrying that she would see the story about the gruesome murder in Oxford. The missing newspaper served as a red flag because part of Hallie's job was to sift through the papers each day and clip out mentions of her employer, the Cleveland Area Chamber of Commerce. The second red flag came when she was asked to go to a meeting in place of her boss. By the time Hallie returned from the meeting ruse, she was feeling off kilter. You know, my morning wasn't going the way it had been going. Um, and the third you know, red flag occurred when I got back from the meeting and my mother and sister were sitting in his office, in my manager's office, and he was nowhere to be found. Um, my initial reaction was something had happened to my father. Um, it was, you know, of course, the last thing you're thinking is that a peer of yours had mm -hmm. passed away. Um, and I took one look at my mother's face and my sister's face, and I knew it was bad. It amazes Hallie in hindsight, but she didn't immediately ask what happened to Beth. She was in such shock, such disbelief, that it didn't occur to her. She didn't know her friend had been murdered until later in the day, and she learned it at the same time she learned Bob had been charged with killing her. She didn't believe it, but she remembers her parents telling her to reserve judgment. I mean, the police were the professionals, right? Surely they had reasons to think the way they were thinking. And then Hallie learned that Bob had confessed. So let me uh, back up to <clears throat> when did you hear that, that he had made a statement? Mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. how, was, how did you find out about that and, and what was your reaction to mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I first learned of it through my parents. And um, so, you know, there were, there were really two things that happened that day. One is learning of her death that morning and then the other was a learning that Bob was being charged with the murder and that he had signed a statement. Um, so uh, there was probably a certain level of shock and, and still to this day I believe and I, I, I think about Beth being in heaven I think we're both still in shock. I, I think of Beth so often still thinking to herself, I can't believe this happened to me, let alone Bob went through what Bob went through. Now, Hallie had lived with Beth from first semester freshman year through May of 1978. At that point, five young women were living together in an apartment on Ardmore in Oxford. The crew was about to split up because most of them had graduated on schedule. Hallie moved back to her parents' home briefly and then to Cleveland, where she started her first post-college job. Beth, Bob, and Sue Parmley all had another semester to finish up before they could get their degrees. So the three of them decided to rent an apartment at Candlewood Terrace, just off campus. Wait, did I say three there? Because here's a funny thing. The trial transcripts, the original detective reports, everything indicates that there were three people living in that apartment, Beth, Bob, and Sue. But when I recently talked to Sue... She threw a wrench into things. It was Bob and Beth lived there, and my boyfriend, John, and I lived there. So the four of us lived in that apartment. And um, John was graduated, but he hadn't decided what he was doing yet, so he hung out in Oxford for another semester. So you had it, so there were two couples in this, in the Candlewood apartment? Mm -hmm. and. I'm guessing that maybe your parents didn't know this. Is that why I haven't heard of John? <laughs> Possibly. Looking at the police documents, it appears investigators didn't know about John. There's no record of him being fingerprinted. 
Nowhere in the thousands of pages of documents and transcripts and interviews and handwritten statements is this guy John mentioned anywhere. Even today's investigators didn't know about the fourth roommate until I told them about it. And this matters because to this day there are still six unidentified fingerprints in this case and two palm prints, and I've been wondering if any of them had been left by the killer. But I can't rule out that maybe they were left by a fourth roommate. It's just another one of those things where I'm like, really, it's nowhere in the police file. This is a new name to me. And really? I've been working on this for months. And, you know, elimination prints wise yeah, that is that is what you would do. Hope so, we don't have to drag like, him into this. No, I don't mean it that way. I'm just kidding. I just mean, if you know, if somebody else lived, they have your your father's prints because he came. Oh, did he get printed too? Yes. Um, huh. He came and helped you. Oh, yeah. Move. Um, well, I'm trying to think. Yeah, my mom and dad were both down there for graduation. And then, yeah, we hauled all my stuff out of there. I didn't have a whole lot, but yeah. How did they not print the fourth person who lived in the apartment? It's just amazing. Anyway, but you're coming. I mean, he was he's a good guy. I don't need to worry about him, right? <laughs> what do you John, mean? John was in Aspen. So there's yes. no, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he wasn't in the state at that time. No, mm-mm. Well, that's, oh, no. that's, that's good. For me, John's very existence shows what a mess the case files are. Sue says she's certain she mentioned him to police. And I believe her, but I don't see that anyone jotted it down. I eventually tracked down John. He said he even flew back to Ohio from Colorado to attend Beth's funeral and to be on hand to talk with police just in case they asked. But he says they never did. So did the police ever... Did, did anybody ever talk to you because you had lived in the apartment, too? And I know they were trying to figure out fingerprints. Yeah, no, never had any contact whatsoever, you know, at any point in time. Uh, I'll, I'll ask now, since they didn't ask then. What, I mean, you said he seemed laid back. Did you ever hear them argue? Uh, did you, was there anything that pointed to what ended up being the police's theory of what happened? No. I never really saw anything that would indicate to me that, you know, he was a violent person or had violent tendencies. I don't remember any arguments, um, things of that nature uh, that I could think of that would really stand out, you know, like major door scram, slam and scream, you know, the, the typical stuff you would expect. John says he was in shock. He flew back to support Sue during the funeral, and when police didn't contact him, he figured it was because they didn't deem it necessary. He focused on helping his girlfriend through the trauma. And for Sue, learning about Beth's murder was devastating. She remembers the call came in the dead of the night. You know, I, I was in bed, and um, the phone rang. I think my parents were in bed, and I, I, my parents had a phone in their room, and I remember my dad coming into me and saying, you know, Beth's been murdered. She's, she's, she was found bound and gagged, and... I mean, I don't know exactly the order of words, but, you know, we were, it was just kind of like a, an explosion. So everybody was like, oh, my God, you know, what? Beth was murdered. She was found and, bound and gagged. And then he talked to the police. I, my mom's like, talk, you know, I'm crying and we're trying to find out what on earth happened. And they're like, well, can you fly down here? So, you know, after that, you you just kind of. We got up, we, the next morning, my dad and I flew down to Cincinnati. And um, I remember um, looking up and watching Mrs. Andes and Gary come in and sit down. And Mr. Andes and Chuck came. They flew down on that flight. We didn't really talk at that time. Um, I just remember looking over at my dad and he's just like, you know, he's just like this, you know, like, oh, my God, you know. I'm sure he's thinking, could have easily been me, how hard it would be to lose a child, what a terrible tragedy. But he, uh, my dad was, he had my back the whole time. 
And we went to the police station and were fingerprinted. And um, uh, I, I think they must have questioned me briefly. I don't have a lot of memory and specific details about that day. Um, I do remember standing, I don't know if it was the airport, somewhere public, could have been the police station. And my dad came up to me and he said, Sue, he said, they think it was Bob. And I just remember going, no, like that, and just like hitting my dad's chest, like totally freaked out. I'm not a violent person at all, but I was just like, oh my God, you know, no way. And he just kind of, he held me and I'm just like, there's no way that that could have happened. That, 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 you know, of course you would be shocked to know that A, it happened, B, it was just so utterly violent, and C, that you would know someone that would do that. The rest of the day and into the following weeks are kind of a blur for Sue. She remembers the case being on the news, though she refused to watch any of the coverage. She'd never even seen the crime scene photos. I didn't share many of the details with her as I talked to her, but eventually she started asking questions. How many times was Beth stabbed? Was she sexually assaulted? Was the door to the apartment forced open? I told her that I trusted that she would only ask if she was ready to hear the answers, and she promised not to blame the messenger. Sue never thought Bob could have hurt Beth, much less kill her. A police statement she wrote in 1978 says the same, describing Bob and Beth's relationship as ideal. She envied them, she said. Bob bought her flowers, and they were very much in love. Sue never once saw them fight. There's a little notation at the bottom of Sue's two-page handwritten statement that breaks my heart every time I see it. It's almost a postscript, written in letters about half the size of the rest of the statement. She wrote, God bless her soul. Soon after Beth died, she was moving to Hilton Head for a teaching job. She remembers Beth's mom approaching her own mother at the funeral. Mrs. Andes came up to her and just said, don't let her go. Whatever you do, don't let her go. And I think, I know when my mom and dad, they, I drove my car down, they, and they drove a car down to help me move some things, and I'm sure it was just so painful for them to leave me down there on my own. And, uh, but they knew they had to, because they knew that's what I was about. That's what Beth would have done. We were all on our way to create our lives. And you know what? I didn't make it very, it was really hard for me down there. So I, you know, developed like checking out my bathroom and shower and you know, I still will never unlock a door without checking to see it's locked. But little things like that. So I think I became a little bit crazy there for a while. But um, I also, I totally remember, you know, not being able to feel better. You know, my mom came down twice and um, I have this great picture of us. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, my mom's here and she can't make this go away. She can't make me feel any better. So it was very frightening that you couldn't find peace or comfort anywhere for me. For the most part, people who knew Bob and Beth together couldn't buy that Bob hurt her. Bob had worked at the Village Center, and several of his co-workers stopped by the Oxford Police Department to fill out voluntary statements. They basically said the cops had the wrong guy. He was way too nice. They'd never seen him mad. At first, that's what R.J. Valella thought, too. But then he remembered that Beth hadn't been her usually bubbly self, and that she said she might need to break up with Bob because they had graduated. RJ says she was upset about it and nervous about telling Bob because she hated confrontation. He also remembered a few moments with Bob that, in hindsight, gave him pause. I, I think I, I saw the beginnings of 
somebody that when they drank alcohol lost their temper and lost their control. I, I witnessed a, a fight uh, uh, in, the, in her parking lot, uh, uh, maybe, a, or not really a fight, but maybe some words exchanged, maybe, a, 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 and it's hard to think back exactly now what happened, but I remember it was at her apartment, I remember Bob was involved, and there was some, uh, he was shouting and, and yelling at another couple guys over something that seemed very silly. So I remember being very, very silly, and I'm saying, God, dude, he's out of control. Okay. Uh, and I remember having to, you know, pull him aside. Hey, say, hey, settle down, settle down. Well, that was the first time I really saw him, like, lose control, lose his temper. Uh, and that was just, like I said, several months before she was murdered. And that kind of came back to me after I thought about it more. At first, I didn't think he could do something like that. Um, but the more I think back on it, I realize now that he... He had a problem with his temper, and they were breaking up, and I, I, it could have been enough to set him off. As a crime reporter, I've written about people who've snapped for no reason at all, so this, of course, seems feasible to me. The problem I have with it, though, comes down to the timeline and the role that alcohol, RJ says, played in Bob's temper. Amanda and I drove the 60-mile route from Fairborn to Oxford recently. While we can't recreate 1978 precisely, we tried to keep some factors consistent. It is 8.42 p.m. and we are leaving the gas station parking lot, turning right onto Black Lane. All right, here we go. 35 miles an hour speed limit. So this is a crucial 15 minutes because police say that when they drove it, it took them 75 minutes. But Bob insists that it took him 90 minutes and those 15 minutes do make a difference. We wanted to see how long it would take us and we ignored Bob's insistence that his car was too much of a junker to get past 60 miles an hour. We followed the speed limit or even went a little faster. Good thing it wasn't a day back then of like texting and phones and stuff because if even if you sat in the parking lot and finished a text message or something you right, know, like, right. of course if they've had text messages he would have been back earlier yeah she would have had to go back to call him at seven and there's there's her apartment somebody's in there no. <laughs> All right, there we go. Stop. All right, so let me shut this off real quick. All right, we just pulled into the parking lot where Bob would have pulled in. It took us one hour, 28 minutes, and five seconds if we're if we're really wanting to be generous, we could trim off five minutes, say two minutes for bad lights and three minutes for one uh, missed turn that we had to fix. Um, but that still puts us at one minute, 20, one hour, 23 minutes. And police said they got here in... 75 minutes, 70, one hour, 15. 75 minutes. And he said it took him just shy of 90 minutes. So, because he comes in at about 9.30, he nine, says. 9.32 is when the police were called. Yeah. And it took him a couple minutes to find somebody home because nobody was home in his actual building. He had to run into the next door. So he's banging around on doors for a couple minutes. So 9.30, I mean, you know, if if you shave off... If if you do what police say, then he had 15 minutes to walk in the door, snap, and go into a murderous rampage, do the deed, clean himself up, and run for help. Not likely. It would... I, I don't see it happening. I mean, yeah, anything's 
possible, but especially in hindsight, you would think that we would see more indications of his severe temper, if that's... And also, the only, the only person we have who talks about him having a temper is RJ, and RJ talks about it in the context of him drinking, which means for him to lose his cool, his friends say he would at least need to be drinking slash be drunk. And those roads would not be easy if you were drunk. Plus, he was taken into police custody immediately after he called for help, and you would think that somebody would notice that he was drunk. Right. This drive became a crucial point during the trial for obvious reasons. But this isn't the only timeline I'm interested in. I became a bit obsessed with what Beth did in the days leading up to her death. This is the timeline I can piece together. It's aided in part by a chronology mapped out by Detective Baird in a 79 letter sent to Charles Andes, that's Beth's father. The parts that don't come from that letter are from other police reports and witness statements and my own interviews. So here it goes. December 22nd marked Beth, Bob, and Sue's graduation day. Beth and Bob had dinner that Friday in Oxford with Bob's parents. Later on during their son's murder trial, they would testify about how happy everyone seemed at that dinner. After graduation, Bob drove Beth to her parents' house in Rocky River for Christmas. Chuck Andes, Beth's brother, remembers that Bob helped their father repair a fence in the yard. He saw nothing concerning about Bob's relationship with his sister. For the record, I should mention that Bob stayed in a separate room from Beth. Chuck's thinking he might have even crashed in his bedroom and maybe Chuck took the couch. This is because Beth had been keeping a little secret from her dad. He didn't know that she was living with her boyfriend. Beth's mom surely knew because they were more like girlfriends than mother and daughter but it was generally agreed that dad wouldn't approve, so that little detail was kept secret. Bob drove his own car and headed home on Christmas Day or possibly early the 26th. The notes on that aren't terribly specific. Beth went to a party in Canton the evening of the 25th, and the next night, she ate dinner with several girlfriends back in Cleveland. On December 27th, Beth and her dad went car shopping during the day, according to Sue. Then Beth borrowed her dad's station wagon and stopped by Bob's parents staying for about a half an hour before heading back down to Oxford. You'll remember much of what she did the next day from episode one, but I found myself particularly interested in what she did Wednesday, the day before she died. It's a little trickier to map out. What I know is that Beth's boss, a manager at a drive through delicatessen in Oxford, called police the morning after Beth died to say he had heard about the murder and he figured they'd want to talk to him. The boss, named Robert Call, though everyone called him Buzz, explained that he hung out with Beth alone at her apartment that Wednesday night. He, of course, wanted to be as helpful as possible, so he spelled out what they did. He said they watched a movie on TV while Beth packed. And they talked about the typical stuff. How was Christmas? Are you excited about the move? That sort of thing. In his handwritten statement, he sounds dumbstruck by her death. She was one of the best employees he'd ever had, he wrote. She was just an awesome girl all around. Quote, I cannot think of one reason why anyone would want to harm her. End quote. He did report one jarring thing about that night. He said Beth had been upset because when she got home, she found her door unlocked, and she thought a maintenance man had left her home vulnerable to robbers. Buzz told her she should officially complain to management the next day, which she did. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. In the end, Buzz says he was at Beth's apartment for about two and a half hours, from about 9 to 11.30 p.m., and then he went home. He saw Beth one more time after that, he said about 10 to 15 minutes after he'd gone the half mile from her apartment to his home on West Spring Street, Beth showed up to use his phone. Remember, her phone was disconnected because she was in the middle of a move, and there weren't cell phones in 78. Buzz said that Beth's phone call didn't go through at first, so she hung out for about 10 minutes before trying again. He thought she was calling her parents. 
We know that Beth got home safely Wednesday night because Thursday is when she met with a real estate agent to put a deposit down on her new Cincinnati apartment. On the way, she was stopped for speeding, and witnesses saw her renewing her license with the updated address about 10 or 10.30 a.m. She shopped for new boots and readied for Bob's arrival that evening. Beth also stopped by the apartment management office that morning to complain about the unlocked door. Multiple maintenance workers remember her doing this, and it was among the chit-chat between Beth and Sue that they exchanged when they talked on the phone Thursday evening. She must have just been calling to keep in touch. She was down there, and again, she was down there alone. And when I mean alone, there was nobody in the apartments. I mean, those were college student housing. So everybody was home for Christmas. It was 27th, 28th of December. Um... As I say, she was busy packing up her apartment and then securing her new apartment and going to move everything down, did some shopping. She, um, those are the three things I remember her talking to me about was looking for a car with her dad. And um, so she's just, you know, sharing her day. And then she got some new boots and I was getting ready to go to, you know, Hilton Head, packing my stuff up and. Um, and she did mention the, you know, the uh, apartment door being left open. Nothing was seemed to be taken or anything like that, but she just didn't appreciate uh, it being left open. Hallie also got a call from Beth on Thursday, and Beth shared this story about the unlocked door again. This door thing really bothered her. Hallie's memory is slightly different, though. She recalls Beth describing how she had confronted the maintenance man at fault. So she was telling the story about Thursday, about how she found the guy and he was in the boiler room and she was, you know, confronting him. You know, hey, bud, were you in my place? Did you, you know, you didn't lock the door. And then, and she even said, you know, um, something about him having keys, right? If you have a key to get in, then you have a key to lock it. I very specifically remember that. Do you remember if she said what his reaction was? Was he, did he respond to her? I don't remember her saying anything about, you know, him responding. It was a very kind of one-sided, you know, conversation. You know, it was more of a, can you believe this guy left my door unlocked sort of thing. I'm not sure if that boiler room confrontation actually happened, but it could have. Beth's a feisty young woman. Is it possible she confronted the wrong kind of guy when she complained about the unlocked door? I'm the type to believe anything is possible, so this is one of the avenues I pursued, especially when I heard that Beth's last stop Thursday before she died was back to the Red Ox, where she picked up cleaning supplies and was still complaining about the unlocked door. The maintenance man's name is Stephen Green. Police talked to him the day after Beth died. He said there's no way he forgot to lock her door. He's borderline OCD, he said. It's just not something he would have done. He also gave police an alibi for the night she was killed. A couple of days after that interview, Steve moved to Las Vegas and was never again talked to by Oxford law enforcement, though not for lack of trying. Jeff Robinson is now lieutenant with the Oxford Police Department. He was brought into the case after Deb Lydon, the lawyer from episode one, started trying to find answers for the family. Robinson has been much more responsive to Amanda and me than the original detectives on the case. Here's me talking to Robinson about the maintenance man. I've also looked for Stephen Green, which, as you know, is... Thanks to Vegas and Florida. Yeah. <laughs> you found him in... Yeah, I did find him in Key West. But I, I, he seems to maybe have a local address at the moment. Yeah, but I can't he, he find tracks phone back number. here. But I've, yeah, I've, he's tracked back here, and uh, he's one of the people that I really would like to talk to. But we have right. never been able to, to. I get bad numbers, and when I try, I've tried addresses. I get bad addresses. Nobody's heard of him there, and he's one I really want to talk to. And right. Just never been able to make that connection. It took months and a drive to Middletown to find somebody with a current phone number. But eventually... Hi, I'm trying to reach Steve Green. You got the guy. What can I do for you? Oh, uh, hi. I'm a, I'm a reporter in Cincinnati. We'll go deeper into that in an upcoming episode. But before we do, we'd like to talk about the trial, because 
It's a doozy. Next time on Accused. He, he definitely had an agenda. He, he, he wasn't letting me out of there until I confessed to it. And, and I firmly believe that. So. This is a special project from the Cincinnati Enquirer, narrated by Amber Hunt, produced by Amanda Rossman, edited by Amy Wilson, and engineered by Stephen Baum at Cincinnati Public Radio. Music was composed by Andrew Higley. To look at case documents, photos, videos, and more, visit cincinnati.com backslash accused podcast.